Justin Towns Earl, and you're watching Noise11.com. And we welcome into Noise11.com, Justin Towns Earl. Welcome back to Australia. Oh. Great to see you down here just uh, recently on the out on the weekend. Yeah, that festival too. That's that was a that was a good festival. BT always knows what he's doing when he puts something together. <laughs> and that was the first one. You got to headline the first Australian festival for out in the weekend. Yeah, it was, and it was it was a great experience, especially to just running into a, a lot of people. That's a, a, the best thing about festivals, I think, is just getting the sounds not always good, and it's often dusty and hot. But you will see people that you don't see very often because of the. We just crisscross each other so uh especially when it happens in a place like uh, in australia because it's a it's a it's a very uh it's a very different place <laughs> <laughs> how many times have you been here i think we counted it at nine or ten this time maybe i know nine times i've toured with my current um well my only tour manager that's all ever worked for me over here so uh yeah he says i think he says nine bt says ten one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Plus a few visits as a kid. Yeah. One. <laughs> one as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, so we'll, yeah. I'll be asking you about the country soon because you probably know more than me. <laughs> uh, single mothers and absent fathers is uh, album number five and six or six and seven, depending on. You Whether know. you count humor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you count humor? I well, I do because it's like I look at a lot of Bruce Springsteen records that only have five to seven songs <laughs> on them. And I'm like, why not? Why isn't that a record? So, um, yeah, I do consider that I've done seven seven bodies of work because I did them in a very int- intentional uh, a very intentional progression, wanting to kind of get the. The things that I knew I loved but weren't cr- quite right for me, but I was intent upon doing uh, first to kind of, uh, you know, wet everybody's palate for it and then kind of be able to dive into the more bluesy and uh, singer-songwriter stuff that where people pay attention to the lyrics as opposed to the um, pedal steel solo and things like that. But I did, I, I felt like I had to do all of those those sections i had to do the woody guthrie record i had to do the you know the uh, ray price record and then after that i think coming out with uh, midnight at the movies that's where Mm -hmm. the course started to change because i realized too that i didn't want the audience i mean i played the grand old opry once and it was appalling i mean just appalling what it has become and uh uh, Americana is unrecognizable uh, (laughs) as Mm -hmm. it is so i just i wanted to make sure that i was I could uh, not be exactly pegged as what I am and yeah. uh, have the freedom to do what I want. If I And if I kept making country records, I'd be country musician. And and uh, what I do these days is not country. I can. I can do it, and I'm, I will one day, but that's not what I'm doing currently. What about that term Americana that you just used there? Do you consider that to be an actual music genre now? Um, well, I think it's been skewed as just like every so-called genre has. I mean, blues has turned into this, you know, kind of just jive. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's not, it's not what Robert Johnson did. You know, it's not what Sleepy John Estes did. It's not, it's not what any of these people did. So where's the blues in it? I don't, I don't get it. And, um, country does that. Hmm. Jazz going into jazz fusion. I mean, you you really does anybody really really think that uh, Buddy Bolden would be happy with what they've done with his music? You hmm. know, I, I think about that. I think Hank Williams would be in a murderous rage. Hmm. Um, but it's happened to everything, and in my generation skewed mountain music and bluegrass, and so the everything has kind of done this. It's it's taken a, a progression that has ended up. Uh, I think just uh, just absolutely uh, leaving the past behind. Nashville's the worst about it. Um, go to Nashville. You're not going to see Nashville. <laughs> you're going to see a little slice of Atlanta uh, that is just, does not represent Nashvilleians at all. And I think that that's the that's the main thing, uh, and it doesn't represent the old stars. That's for that's for sure. <laughs> is Nashville today more about the song than the performer? Um, no, I think it's more about the performer. I mean, the song has become a assembly line kind of thing where 
you have, I mean, look at your average country hit today and uh, you'll see at least two riders and usually four or five or more. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that there were five writers on, she thinks my tractor's sexy. Mm -hmm. If it takes five people to write a song <laughs> like that, what, yeah. what is going on? Yeah. You know, so the, I guess the focus actually is on the publishing cause that's where the money is, but it's not, definitely not on the song. That's for sure. I don't think barely anybody who is a, a country star these days could write their way out of a wet paper sack, mm. you know, <laughs> no way. Yeah, but that I guess was also true last week of the Billboard Top 100 Singles chart. There were only two songs in the entire Top 100 <coughs> written by one person. Yeah, and that's, everything else was a collaboration. Ninety-eight yeah. songs were collaborations. And that's not. And like I said, that's not art. That's an assembly line. Um, that's a bunch of people just yelling out ideas. And uh, you know, and they usually, you know, they don't, they don't say it like this, but it's like we need to find a way to appeal to the lowest common denominator, mm -hmm. and that's just. Uh, I would, I'd much rather try to think of a way to, you know, bring them back to a time when everybody listened to Elvis and the Beatles, and that was the most popular music, and it was actually good music all through the '50s and '60s. You did have a large part of the music community that was making good really good music influenced by the past and wearing those influences on their shoulder mm. slowly went away with the uh, advent of synthesizers and and all these things and there was great music made all through in the 80s but it started really thinning out I mean really thinning out the only two bands that I still well three that I revere from the Seattle scene Mud Honey, Mother Love Bone and Nirvana mm -hmm. You know, and it's like three out of thousands of bands that came out of that damn scene. <laughs> yeah, and all around the same time, there was something happening in the water at that point. Yeah, wasn't it? just kaboom, just like Athens, Georgia before. Mm. I mean, every every A and R man uh, in the country and all over the world was in those two cities right after each other. You know, mm. so Athens first, Seattle next, and the only difference is uh, is we did the Seattle just made it a little dirtier. You know, I love those old B-52 records mm. and uh, the early R.E.M. records and all that, all that stuff, the Vic Chestnut records, uh, the stuff that was recorded before his unfortunate accident. And um, while there was just such good things coming out of there, a lot of good things. So I think it is true. Uh, Bill Withers had an interview in Rolling Stone recently where he just said that he felt like his time was over. He did not understand anything that was happening uh, in the business or musically anymore, and he felt like he just doesn't. He couldn't make records anymore, and he didn't. He didn't uh, feel like they would be uh, the the people would know how to take his records these days. He just he says I really, and he said I just don't want any part of it. Mm. And I think that that's a growing uh, feeling when our when our the people that came before us start saying that they don't understand. Our music and want to drop out of it because they're so they don't like it hmm. at all. That's wow, how sad is that? But do, is that that they're not liking an industry because it has become more industry in the music industry than music these days? I think that there's a, there the the business is probably the uh, in a large part that the business has always been the same. It's just the reach of it has gotten more. The stakes have rise. The artists make more money, just like the record labels make more money now. Um, your chances are less because the the, the market is saturated com completely. And but I think too that it's just the the lack of soul and a lot of records made these days. It's the it's the idea that, I mean, how many uh, stars are out there that you hear, you can obviously hear auto-tune on their records, mm. and not like they're using it for all that crazy stuff, but you can hear it in the lines, and they don't, they don't sing. Like, they can't sing, they can't write, they can't, you know, it's like, what, what, how are you a star? Mm. You know, who did this? And, and that's pretty, I think that, you know, when you thought about, you know, my, my grandparents listening to Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, Hike Turner and the Rhythm Kings and something. <laughs> it's like, wow, they got a much better deal than we did. What about you going into the studio then? Uh, who do you use as a sounding board? Um, well, I use my band mostly. Um, it's a, I have a group of musicians that I respect very, very much that I've actually, I saw bands that they were in, my steel player was in um, 
Calexico for about a decade. And my drummer and my bass player uh, had a band called Centromatic. And so I saw these guys for the first time when I was around 16 or 17 separately, you know, at different shows. And I just, you know, I remember saying right when I saw them, I was like, that, wow, those are, if I could get all of Centromatic with Paul Niehaus, that would be an amazing band. Well, I can't get all of Centromatic, but I got the rhythm section at least. So I look up to the musicians that I play with very much. Um, and um, I've, they, I, they have a respect for me and the songs that I write, and they're really, really good at, uh, they're, they play for the song, not for the, uh, they don't, not to get great licks in or great runs or anything like this. It's just they, they play with the song and accentuate the song, and uh, it's everything that I thought it would be playing with these guys. I mean, I'm not disappointed at all, so they're a very good, between them, and Adam Bednarik, my engineer, I got a, I think I got a good, a good few people to bounce things off of, mm. for sure. With uh, single mothers and absent fathers, we're talking, you know, two very personal uh, collections of songs here. Uh, is this therapeutic for you when you write these songs and then share those experiences with the audience? Well, it, it is in a in a big way because I think the. Um, the only thing that I can uh, credit it to is just I I realized early on that just like uh, they say just like extremely wealthy people are one percent uh, junkies are one percent so the things that I, I human beings we, we we experienced a different severity but we, we we have all the same feelings we may feel them to different extents they may take us to different places um, now that's completely r relatable. Like um, I got sad, and and these, uh, and uh, you know, and you ended up in this place. You know, people can relate to that, the feeling of that. You know, how you felt, what made you do that, which is what I try to stick to. Um, it does make it feel. It does make it feel very personal, even though my my songs are composite characters. Um, I don't think anybody's interesting enough to really write an entire song with without adding something to it. Um, so I pick up my characters from, uh, I mean, from everywhere. I mean, it's, you know, just a person walking down the street and it just, the movement that they make, like, kind of will throw this idea in my head that kind of spins it around. When I wrote a song, Ain't Glad I'm Leaving, um, I, uh, I was in a diner somewhere. Um, I was young, I was about 16 years old, and. We were out on the road playing coffee shops, and I heard this old redneck guy say, woman, if you're not glad I'm leaving now, you're going to be. Mm. And so uh, that that was like, I was like, whoa. And I wrote that down. I ain't glad I'm leaving, girl, you know you ought to be. Became the, I took a little bit out of it. And um, and, and that's the, the thing is just like everybody has probably seen that guy in the diner now and then. And relating, just relating to the feelings of life as opposed to the actual experience of life, open up the feeling and people will take it to their own place. Mm. You know, offering them as much room uh, on the canvas as you can give them. Mm. As the, uh, the albums are relatively new, you haven't had uh, all of that much opportunity to perform uh, these songs yet. I think, you know, most of them have at least less than two dozen times that you've uh, performed a lot of these songs live and some of the ones you've been doing in Australia uh, Call Your Mother uh, When uh, the One You Love Loses Faith uh, and Around the Band you did it at Blues Fest yeah. um, They were both from the uh, Absent Fathers album mm -hmm. uh, 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 White Gardenia's Single Mothers uh, Tonight in a Lonely Night and Time Shows Fools yeah. uh, Some of the ones from the Mothers album uh, that you've uh, chosen to perform while you've been in Australia. Yeah. Um, why the collection of uh, of those particular songs off those two albums? Well, my um, when I play solo shows, there's there's no set list. I just kind of pull things like try to think. You know, it'll have a kind of loose like I'll start with this song. You know, maybe end with this song, but through the middle of it, it is a constant a constant thought. I try to put them together in a in a smooth kind of way um but it's a uh, i try to um very uh, very consciously or hopefully very consciously try to 
um, pull just a little bit off of all of my records and I can come up with 17 songs or so that mm. will make up a show. Um, but that's, uh, um, the order of it is very important even though that it, it's made split second. So you, you might, you might hear a more heavy Harlem River set. You might mm. hear a more heavy, uh, single mother set. It mm. just kind of goes back and forth. And I love that about solo shows, the mm. freedom of that. Cause I did it for so long. And now having a band, you really can't, you know, just turn around and say blah blah, you know, and then just decide that tune, and then everybody tunes up. It just doesn't move fast enough. Um, and so I, uh, I, having that, just being able to be like, yep, yeah, I'm gonna do this song right now is uh, um, is what it has always been like, and I'm glad I can still do it because I mean I I do realize that I'm very fortunate to be able to perform uh, solo. Mm. Not a lot of artists can do it, and they definitely can't do it well, mm. you know, from what I've seen anyway. What about the uh, the cover songs that you do? Is this about representing your influences? Uh, Fleetwood Mac, Dreams, um, has popped up Lightning Hopkins, I've been uh, Burning Bad Gasoline, and Billy Joe Shaver, I've been to George on a Fast Train. Yeah. Uh, some of the songs that have been covered by you on this uh, tour. Billy Joe Shaver, for instance, isn't that well known no, he's down not. here. Fleetwood Mac, of course, you know, everybody in the world knows. Yeah. Uh, but And Lightning Hopkins. We're talking about three completely different acts there. Yeah. Which, you know, indicates to me that you've got a, a, a very diverse uh, personal music taste. I Well, you know, I've, I'm very... I've always considered... Uh, the most important music that's, I mean, think about what's come, every popular form of music with the exception of hip hop has come out of the southeastern United States. Rock and roll, jazz, blues, country, mm. bluegrass, mountain music. It all came from there, blended with the, uh, the different accents of the mixed people in the mountains and in the bayous. Um, the flu influx into New Orleans of, of uh, cotton workers looking for mm. a better life working on the docks brought the blues uh, to these more technical Creole musicians who considered themselves uh, European <laughs> when they were growing up there and that mm. and then here came jazz you know so that's uh, these these different people and, and forms of music that came there I mean think about it, all those somehow made their way to Memphis and became rock and roll. Um, and that's a very, um, that's an incredible thing, the journey of all those musics and how they ended up in the same place at the same time. It's very, very intriguing. And, and where they began, I mean, when you think about the idea of all of a sudden Buddy Bolden just mm -hmm. like comes up with swing. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he just starts swinging one night, swinging the way that he was playing his cornet. And jazz was started, and I believe that wholeheartedly, that that's the way it worked, because he was a troubled soul, mm. and a lot of times they're the best. And uh, all everybody, um, old men who were alive at that time, who were mostly gone now, told, uh, I mean, well, no, they're all gone now, told, you know, talked about him like he, he was God. Um, and you think about Louis Armstrong, who he said the first night he laid a hand, uh, his hands on a, on a horn, he went home and was just messing with it and figured out he could play when the saints <laughs> come marching in the first night he had it. And so this just amazing original form of music popped up, some blues did too, rock and roll and all these things just to, it was a, it's an unstoppable circle of of life that's getting tougher to keep into the the respect for the past and and the people that came before has never uh, been uh, ignored more hmm. never drifted into the obscurity as it has now you mentioned troubled soul there and um, and and the songs that can come from a troubled soul you know you've had your issues in the past people like Warren Zevon uh, and the issues that he had yeah and some of the great songs that he wrote while he was having those issues. Yeah. Um, do you write better songs when you're in a situation like that? I, I mean, I don't think that, I mean, I, hopefully as a writer, you don't have to be in any particular place to write. You just write. And I've never had to be any, in any particular place. Um, I don't, I've written great, I think, not great, but good songs while I've been 
in bad positions and um, on drugs and all these things. None of that makes you a better rider. There's no way with a one-track mind of sadness and all these things that you can really... You'll write a few songs, but nobody wants to hear a whole record of that crap, like a, a, mm. a weepy diary entry and things like that. So, um, no, I think that it's like a, just if you're a writer, you're a writer. And just, you know, I thought that I'd never be able to write sober, but that's dumb to think that <laughs> you're going to write better impaired than you are going to write uh, with your mind clear. You mm. know, do you think you're a better driver when you're drunk? <laughs> yeah. Probably not. How much do you identify now with the songs from Humor and the Good Life? Um, I, I still, I mean, I, I haven't listened to, I don't listen to my records whatsoever after I make them. Um, it keeps me away from doing the same thing, and and I just don't want to hear them after I've mastered them. But I am proud of the way that I've, I've made my records. The way the progression that I've made in those records I think that it it did set me up for what I I have now um and it's a I think that that's a I, I think that all you know being an artist who you know started with these started with a thousand dollar record and sold a thousand records out of his out of the trunk of his car to you know making a good a good an embarrassing amount of money to do something that you love I believe and uh, it's it's so uh, I don't think it would have worked without that that progression you know hmm. it's a uh, and luckily it was like Johnny Cash is huge again and it, it came in and I that's what I would like doing anyway hmm. but it was me searching through all the American forms of music for uh, where I felt most comfortable, and I figured out once I, I started with the Blue Lightning Hopkins, Mance Lipscomb, all these people, and so um, I'm drifting back toward that, but going for more of the Ike Turner kind of sound, especially with my next record, which I'm uh, the plans have begun for it, and I've started writing one song. When will we hear that? Um, hopefully, uh, early next year. Hmm. Were you like a kid in a candy store when you were? producing the Wanda Jackson album? It was uh, it was an amazing experience and it was it was not as scary as I thought it would be. I can't I got it I at first you know, before I was nervous and I was putting everything together, making sure that it was perfect, that I understood these songs um, very well and, you know, I went to dinner with her. You know, I didn't realize how small she was. I mean, she's just tiny. She comes up about to the middle of my rib cage. Yeah. So I figured out working with her. Um, I was told to keep a bottle of white wine and a bottle of red wine around. Just so she, she her nerves got bad and she didn't drink a lot. She just would like to have a a glass of wine. And um, I knew that a figure looming over her. I, I know that she had figures looming over her her entire career, pretty much. Hmm. You know, that's how that worked. She had the you know, the uncle or colonel whatever hanging over mm -hmm. your shoulder. And I really wanted her to make a record that was a Wanda Jackson record. And, and so I I didn't ever talk to her. I always kind of dropped down to my knees um, and uh, took her hand and was like, you know, like, you know, I can, you're a little clammy right now. Do you need to just take her, sit down for a minute and think about this? And and she was definitely, uh, I think she, she didn't touch those bottles of wine. Mm -hmm. They were still sitting there, uh, you know, sealed up. And I got, them, I got one of them as a trophy on my, <laughs> <laughs> on my mantle. Uh, are you working with anyone else? Will you produce more people in the future? I'm, I'm looking at some, you know, some projects with people. Uh, Marlon Williams. Um, oh. Yeah. Has uh, he did a tour opening for me, and I mm. just was I was blown away with him. Mm. He writes good songs. He's an amazing singer. Um, he's got some edges to some rough edges to take off, and a little bit of a, we all got something to learn. Mm. You know, always this business is so changing so fast. And w would you do that here or in the states? He really wants to do it here and. Uh, or in New Zealand, but uh, I, I'm gonna change his mind about that. <laughs> and take him over to the US? Yeah, and uh, I don't think that it would be, I mean, 
we can lock ourselves into a little world and record that record in Nashville. I've always been able to do that, but just the feel of that city these days, it's like um, probably be the last record that I would make there Um, because it just doesn't feel good anymore. (laughs) Not at all. Mm. Not to, I mean, locals are not happy about it and they tell everybody that we're happy about it. Mm. Yeah. That would be a, a magnificent project to hear. We can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, Justin Townsville, we thank you for joining us here at noise11.com. Oh, well, thanks for having me.